Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Can you believe that we are in July? That means we have been in this sermon series for exactly half of the year. Uh, right now, we're halfway through our sermon series together, uh, looking at this, this story of Scripture and how God is at work in and through his people. I, I can't believe, actually, that we're in July, which has got me thinking a lot about calendars. And so today I decided to, to start with a, a question. I, I do this sometimes on our weekly podcast where we go a little bit deeper into the sermon, but I decided today to, to start with it. it it's, a, it's a simple question. Um, it has three options. You can pick which one works for you. As you think about calendars, are you a person who has a, a paper calendar still that you still want to write every single event and keep it with you? Uh, my father-in-law used to keep his right here in his chest pocket, and I used to make fun of him for that quite a bit. Are you that person that you have a, you have a paper calendar still? Are you a person that wants all of yours digitally in, in sync and, and maybe even coordinated with other members of the family? You keep it all on your phone or on your tablet? Do you, do you keep a digital calendar? Or, or the third calendar, the third question is, do you keep a calendar at all? Or are you just a, a free wheel and I'll take it as it comes? Uh, maybe you are blessed to be retired and so you don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of events on your calendar. Do, do you keep a calendar at all? If I were to look at your calendar this morning, an honest look at your calendar, like, like you put everything on it that you do or that is important to you. If I, looked at, if, if I could look at that calendar, what would I see? What would I see? A week full of interactions with people that are opportunities to speak the gospel? Or if we're really honest, what I see an hour or maybe even the morning of Sunday marked off as God time and the rest of the week being considered your time or work time or kid time or family time. Here at St. Andrew, we talk a lot uh, about one particular phrase. Well, we use several phrases, but this one is, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and whomever you're with, your life is about Jesus. We shorten that often to wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and whomever you're with. But, but the point is that we understand that our lives have been claimed, as the Apostle Paul wrote in Colossians, that we died and our lives, our life is now hidden with Christ. Do, do we see our life as Christ's life being lived through us, or is God a compartmentalized piece of the way that we live our lives. We talk a lot about that at St. Andrew because this notion that God has claimed us and taken our life and hidden in our life in his is actually a, an amazing gift. It is what it means to be the people of God. It means that we have been set aside by God for his purposes. That, that's what we read in the scriptures. We read about God claiming a people for himself, the descendants of Abraham, that have become a, a great nation. They've settled in the promised land. They've asked for and received a king. In fact, they've received several kings. We've heard about the kingdom splitting and ultimately the northern kingdom being conquered by the Assyrians and the southern kingdom being conquered by the Babylonians. We've heard about God's call to the people that we are supposed to settle even in exile, that we're supposed to settle and pray and marry and plant fields and live lives. Vicar Tim did an amazing job with that message a couple of weeks ago. And the point of that is that we're still to remember that we are God's people, even in the midst of our bondage and our, our foreign landness. And last week, Vicar Jared also did an amazing job talking to us about what does it mean to look to God during those times when we feel rejected, when we feel alone. We, we talked about Daniel and, 
and Daniel gathering his friends and going to the Lord together in the midst of the distress. Today, we're still in exile. God's people are still in exile. In fact, the Persians have replaced the Babylonians as, as those in charge. They've, they've taken over and and yet God's people are still living this exiled life. They're no longer in the land that God promised them. And they're trying to figure out what does it mean to still be his people. Last week, we talked about those times that we feel rejected and exiled. Like we don't belong here and yet this is where we are. This whole notion is a very interesting theological one. It, it has a title. It's called a vocation. It's, it's this notion that actually um, wherever I am, whatever I'm doing and whomever I'm with, God has placed me here right now for his purposes, purposes that may or may not ever be known to me. And I don't know about you, but I take great comfort in that because there are times that I'm like, oh, Lord, why? Why am I in the midst of this circumstance or this place or with these people? And yet to remember that God has placed me here, God has placed you where he's placed you in the circumstances, in the family, in the workplace or school that he has placed you is an important reminder and that God's claim is that, that wherever you are right now, whatever you're doing this moment and whomever you're with, it is in fact about being the people of God, living as his people. Today, I want to give you one little piece of this that I think might help as we wrestle what does it mean to live as the people of God, wherever we are, whatever doing it, whomever we're with. It's found in the book of Esther. Esther is an exile book. The, the Persians have, in fact, taken over. And the king of Persia, uh, Xerxes or Ahasuerus uh, in the scriptures, we, we think he's also the king Xerxes listed in history. But, but he's reigning and he has a little tiff with his wife and he throws down a national beauty pageant to find his next king and he ends up marrying a Hebrew girl named Esther. You might remember that a couple of years ago, we did a deep dive into the book of Esther in one of our sermon series. You can find that on our website, uh, video archives, or on our YouTube channel. But, but the short story is that in exile, Esther becomes queen and then discovers a plot by the king's right-hand man. The plot is to have the Jews executed. And Esther has to make a choice. It's a choice that I want to set before you today as a challenge. You see, to be the people of God means to be two things. It means to be a lot of things, but in this context, it means, it means really two things that I think we can focus on today. It means having the courage to speak even when it's hard to do so. I want to say that again for you. Because I, I know some of you are note takers. Being the people of God, especially in exile, but, but actually being the people of God wherever God has placed us means in part having the courage to speak, even when it's really difficult doing so. That's what we see in Esther. Esther uncovers this plot that her people are going to be killed and she has to make a decision. Is she going to speak truth of this plan? Is she going to speak truth to the king about who she is and where she comes from, her identity? Is she going to speak of the fact that she is one of God's special people or, or not? To speak means that she might face death. You don't walk into the presence of the king and make a request of him. Uh, even when he begs you as he does in this story, you don't accuse the king's right-hand man very easily. And yet, because she's found favor with the king, she's done what we talked about a couple of weeks ago. She's lived and made a family and made a home and planted and prayed. Uh, she finds favor with the king. And the king asks her for a request. And after a couple of attempts, she finally 
shares her request. It's that the king would intervene and that his people would be saved. That the king would step into the situation to save his people. That took a lot of courage for Esther. A lot of courage for Esther. But that's what it means to be the people of God. It means that we, that we speak God at things, even when it's really hard, even when it requires courage or has a potential really negative outcome, even leading up to and including death. It means that we root ourselves in the truth, and the truth is what we speak. A little quick personal note. Uh, obviously, we, we've talked about Pastor Ware before and how this represents the voice of God. I have to tell you sometimes, this is a burden. You, you know that. It's a burden for you, too, to speak the words of God. Because sometimes speaking the word of God makes you very, very unpopular. Sometimes speaking about God things in the way that God uh, articulates them and desires them to be is, is really, really difficult. Because sometimes we, the hearers, don't want to hear the word of God. Which leads us to the second thing I want us to think about today. Being the people of God means to have the courage to speak God's stuff even when it's difficult. But being the people of God also means having the courage to hear God's stuff when it's spoken to us. That the king here in the story of Esther isn't even one of God's chosen people. Now, I'd like to believe that Esther's influence on him is going to lead him to faith and he's going to be saved, but the scriptures don't tell us that. No, we have this pagan Persian king. And yet even he, when truth is spoken to him, responds accordingly. He's open to hearing it. We can read this story and we can gloss over the fact that he could have had Esther killed. He's already put one wife out in this book. Vashti has already been exiled because she didn't please the king. And he could have done the same thing to Esther, but he had the courage to hear God's word, to have his worldview challenged. He believed Haman was a good man, an, an upright man, a, a man that had good intentions. And yet when he heard God's word, when he heard Esther speaking truth to him, he had the courage to hear it and to act accordingly. I, I wonder if sometimes... We don't have the courage to hear God's word. Actually, I don't wonder that at all. I know from experience that we don't sometimes have the courage to hear God's word. And that's not just you who don't have the courage to hear God's word when I speak it. That's me who doesn't have the courage sometimes to hear God's word when it's spoken. Because we all have a tendency to turn inward on ourselves to value our own opinions more highly than we ought. To value our worldviews and our culture and our conditioning more than what God has to say to us. And so today, as we, as we pause in this book of Esther, I, I really truly want us all, myself included, to reflect upon what it means to be the people of God, to have the courage to speak truth and to have the courage to hear truth when it's spoken. Which leads us to the finale of the book. Haman speaks truth. Uh, Esther speaks truth to the king about Haman and the king responds by hearing truth. And, and Haman at the end of the book, just outside town, hangs on a wooden instrument of death. Because that's what happens to sin and rebellion. Those of us who are rebellious against our ruler deserve death. The king heard Esther's plea and intervened and put sin and rebellion to death. That's what God wants, to put sin 
and rebellion to death. That's why in the church, the most sacred symbol is the cross. Because it's there that we see sin and rebellion being put to death. I love that the story of Haman ends with Haman dying on a tree. Because it reminds us of when Christ did that. Now, I know, I know your reaction might be right now to say, yeah, 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 but, but Pastor John, Haman was evil, plotting to kill people. Haman was sinful. Jesus wasn't. Jesus was pure. He didn't deserve to die. And I would respond, he didn't deserve to die, and yet, and yet, if we take scripture at a whole, it will eventually land on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. I think maybe there's not a more powerful sentence in the whole scripture. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, we read that he who was that he was made to be sin who knew no sin. I'm going to say that again because I kind of bumbled it. He was made to be sin who knew no sin. Don't miss that. Jesus didn't just go to the cross to pay for our sin. He certainly did that, but he became sin. He who knew no sin became a sin. He became Haman on the cross because Haman needed to die. He, he became the murderer who kills 400 people. He, he became him so that that person could exchange his death sentence for a life sentence in Christ. He became sin for you and for me, who also deserve death and gave us in exchange his life. That's what it means to be the people of God. Who are willing to speak truth, a truth that might be very unpopular. Who have the courage to hear truth. Who see their calendar as Sunday to Sunday God time. That's what we mean when we say wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and whomever we're worth, we're trying to help all of us come to terms with the fact that our whole week, our whole lives have been claimed by Christ. And that will require of us sometimes talking to our pagan friends and talking to our Christian friends to speak unpopular words of truth. And we're called in scriptures to speak those words in love, and I would encourage you to do that, but, but we are called to speak them in a God-pleasing way. We're also called to hear them. When truth is spoken to us, when our worldview is challenged. Because all of that sits at the foot of the cross. We're just like Haman. Jesus died because of sin and brokenness and rebellion. Jesus died so that your life and my life could be hidden in his life so that we could be the people of God, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and whomever we're with. You see the cycle. And so this week, my prayer for you and for me is that we have the courage to speak the word of God to speak it in love, but to speak it. To speak truth when called upon. And that likewise, when someone speaks truth to us, because in our own inward turning, we need to hear truth, that we actually have the courage to hear it. Will you pray with me about all of that this morning? Let's pray together. <laughs> Heavenly Father, God, you are good. And you are merciful to us. God, I thank you that you have claimed my life. I thank you that through baptism, you have claimed the life of those who are listening and watching right now online. I pray as always, God, that you remind us that you did not take our life in part. You took all of it. That every aspect of our life, the way we 
conduct ourselves at work, the things we do at home, the things we do in private, all of it, Lord, is yours. And God, eventually that will lead us to the realization that we're not very good at this. We're really good at being compartmentalized. We're really good at being partial. We're really good at trying to put you in a little box, but we're not super great at living out this vocational life of wherever you are, whatever you're doing, and whomever we're with. It, it's a weakness, God, and so I pray that you would forgive us. Again today, forgive us for our self-centeredness and our arrogance, for our self-dependence and our fear. God, strengthen in us the resolve that we are your kids, not because we do this well, but because you did this well, because you who knew no sin became our sin, became a sin for us. You put sin to death on the cross. And just like the king in the story of Esther, you intervened and you saved your people through that act. And so, God, by your spirit, not only remind us that we are your kids, but strengthen us to do better tomorrow and the next day and the day after. In fact, Lord, to do better this afternoon and this evening. Strengthen us to live as your people, having the courage to speak truth and having the courage to hear truth. Lord, we pray today for those who are sick, hospitalized, and struggling. We pray for those who are lost. We pray for guests that might be with us right now, that your word would penetrate them, that they would hear you speaking even now. We pray, Lord, that our church online and in person would be a place of hospitality and of grace where truth is spoken and truth is heard and people grow in what it means to be your church. And now, God, we ask that you would hear us as your people, the church, as we join together with one voice and pray the prayer that your Son, our Lord Jesus, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.